In the quiet town of Aspen, Colorado, a chilling mystery unfolded on a cold winter's day in 2014. A gruesome crime, shrouded in secrecy, left the community in shock and disbelief. An individual, known and loved by many, met a tragic and untimely end, forever altering the tranquility of this picturesque mountain town. Nancy Pfister's life story is a fascinating journey that begins in Orofino, Idaho, where she was born on July 4, 1956. She grew up in the picturesque suburb of Aspen, Colorado, called Basalt, and attended Basalt High School. Nancy's family had a unique history tied to the development of Buttermilk Ski Resort. Her father, Art Pfister, turned the family cattle ranch into this renowned ski resort in 1958, making a significant fortune in the process. Nancy's mother, Betty Has Fister, had a remarkable past as well. She had been a member of the Women Air Force Service Pilots during Second World War. While she started her college journey at Brooklyn's Pratt Institute, she decided to drop out and return to her roots in Colorado at the age of 20. Back home, she continued to play a significant role in managing her family's business which held a prominent place in the local tourism industry. At the age of 29, despite never having been married, Nancy welcomed her daughter, Juliana, into the world. Later, at the age of 39, she gave birth to a son. Nancy Pfister's life was marked by her dedication as a single mother, raising her two children in a log home that her father had lovingly built for her in 1991. On that fateful day, February 26, a visit to the home of Nancy. Her friend Kathy Carpenter took an unexpected and terrifying turn. It had been three long days since they had last seen or spoken to each other, and Kathy's concern had grown too great to ignore. As Kathy stepped into Nancy's home, she called out for her friend, desperately seeking a response. But the eerie silence that greeted her sent shivers down her spine. Her heart sank when she noticed a chilling detail, a small smear of blood on the headboard of Nancy's bed. The room itself was in disarray, with the covers thrown aside as if there had been a struggle. But the most disturbing discovery was yet to come. Nancy's bedroom harbored a large walk-in closet, and Kathy's worry deepened when she found the door locked. Desperate to uncover the truth, she retrieved a spare key she kept for the closet and cautiously opened the door. What met her senses was beyond her worst nightmares, a nauseating, unbearable stench. Inside the closet lay a lifeless body. In a state of shock, Kathy immediately dialed 911 at 6.15 p.m., her voice trembling as she reported the grisly discovery. Her belief was that the lifeless figure in the closet was Nancy herself. The arrival of the police only confirmed Kathy's fears. Nancy's lifeless body was indeed concealed within the closet, shrouded in a heavy-duty trash bag from the neck down, with additional kitchen trash bags obscuring her head. The scene was a horrifying tableau of violence. Nancy had been brutally beaten to death, her head bearing the evidence of multiple blunt force traumas. An electrical extension cord had been cruelly wrapped around her neck, a chilling detail that added a gruesome layer to the crime. Despite the brutality of Nancy's attack, there was very little blood at the scene, apart from the small smear on the headboard. But when the investigators turned the mattress over, a stark contrast was revealed a large pool of blood soaked into the fabric. It became evident that whoever had attacked Nancy had taken the chilling step of flipping the mattress to hide the gruesome aftermath before departing. The question that haunted both Kathy and the police was, who could perpetrate such a heinous and brutal act upon Nancy? It was a question that sent shockwaves through their peaceful community, leaving them grappling with the unsettling realization that a heartless killer lurked among them. Kathy Carpenter's revelation added a new layer of complexity to the already baffling case. She informed the police that there had been recent tensions between Nancy and her tenants, William Trey Styler and his wife, Nancy Styler. This information instantly cast suspicion on the Stylers and raised questions about their possible involvement in Nancy's gruesome murder. 
The day after Nancy's lifeless body was discovered, an autopsy was conducted by Dr. Steve Ayers, the Pitkin County coroner. His findings shed light on the brutality of the crime. Dr. Ayers determined that Nancy had met her demise through three or four vicious blows to the head, inflicted with a hard object possessing a slightly curved edge. Although he couldn't pinpoint the exact type of weapon used, he could conclude that the business end of the instrument was relatively small, within an inch or two. The timeline of Nancy's death remained somewhat elusive, but Dr. Ayers estimated that the fatal assault likely occurred between the evening of the 24th of February and the morning of the 25th of February. The injuries sustained by Nancy were concentrated between her right forehead and right temple, indicative of three or four severe blows. Additionally, several bruises marred her left upper arm, right neck, and right jaw, painting a grim picture of the merciless violence she endured. With Dr. Ayer's conclusive determination that Nancy Feister's death was the result of a homicide, the investigation took a critical step forward, intensifying the search for answers and justice. The focus now squarely rested on uncovering the truth behind the Styler's involvement and any other potential suspects who might hold the key to solving this chilling and deeply unsettling murder mystery. The police's investigation took a crucial turn as they delved into the intricate dynamics between Nancy Feister, the victim, and the Stylers, her tenants. It was clear that there was more to the story than initially met the eye. Nancy Feister's decision to rent out her luxurious mountain home during her annual warm weather sojourns became a pivotal part of the puzzle. Her ad in the Aspen Times had been straightforward offering a three-bedroom house with three-and-a-half baths, strategically located on the mountain. The only stipulation was no cats. It was this ad that caught the attention of Trey and Nancy Styler, who were contemplating a fresh start in Aspen, away from their troubles in Denver. At first glance, the Stylers appeared to be ideal tenants. Nancy Styler, a world-renowned expert in lily pads, and Trey, a retired anesthesiologist who had been forced to leave his position due to a debilitating neurological disease, seemed like responsible individuals who would take good care of the property. However, the Stylers' seemingly tranquil life had been disrupted by a series of setbacks. Lawsuits had drained their savings, leaving them in financial turmoil. Trey's illness had forced him to step down from his role as chief of staff at a Denver hospital bringing about further hardship. In a desperate bid to reinvent themselves, they had decided to move to Aspen, an affluent and promising destination. Nancy Styler's background in medicine had led her to explore new possibilities. She had pursued courses in Botox and laser treatments with hopes of starting a spa in Aspen. The allure of wealthy residents, celebrities, and tourists in the area made it an attractive prospect. When they stumbled upon Nancy Fister's ad, it appeared to be the perfect opportunity for them to establish themselves and make connections in their new community. And so, the Stylers became Nancy Fister's tenants. The once promising relationship between landlord and tenants had inexplicably deteriorated to the point where Nancy Feister met a brutal end within her own home. Now, the police were faced with the daunting task of unraveling the events that had led to this tragic outcome. Striving to uncover the motives and circumstances behind the disturbing murder of Nancy Feister. The police's conversation with Trey and Nancy Styler painted a vivid picture of the deteriorating relationship between them and Nancy Feister. It was clear that their initial optimism about the tenancy had soured leading to a deep-seated animosity. According to Nancy Styler's account, their initial interactions with Nancy Pfister had been positive. They had responded promptly to her ad in October and had been welcomed warmly into her home. Nancy Pfister had even expressed interest in investing in their new business venture. However, the situation took a turn for the worse after they moved in. The Stylers claimed that Nancy Pfister's behavior shifted dramatically becoming demanding and, in their words, akin to being treated as slaves. 
Therefore, when Nancy Feister departed for her trip to Australia in November 2013, the stylers were relieved to have her absence. During Nancy Feister's absence, she had enlisted the help of her friend Kathy to collect rent and look after her labradoodle. However, by January 2014, tensions had escalated. Nancy Fister began posting complaints on Facebook, alleging that the Stylers had stopped paying rent and owed her money for utilities. Nancy Styler acknowledged receiving multiple messages and emails from Nancy Fister during this period. In a surprising turn of events, Nancy Feister informed the Stylers in February 2014 that she was returning three months earlier than planned and demanded that they vacate her house before her arrival. Some of the Stylers' belongings, including spa equipment for their business, remained stored in Nancy Fister's garage when she returned home. Upon her return, Nancy Feister wasted no time in addressing the matter. She entrusted Kathy with delivering a note to Trey outlining her claims that they owed her $14,000 for utilities and damages to her property, demanding payment. Nancy Feister also allegedly threatened to obtain a restraining order to keep the Stylers off her property, although the Stylers questioned the legality of such an action. According to Nancy Styler's version of events, they visited the house to retrieve their belongings after receiving Nancy Feister's note. Nancy Feister was not present at the time, and they entered the house to collect their property, spending time there until 4 p.m. They returned the following morning to finish the task, still not encountering Nancy Fister. However, during their visit, they did notice that Nancy's dog was left alone in the house. Nancy Styler claimed to have no knowledge of what had happened to Nancy Fister, as they had not seen her during their visits to the property. The Nancy Feister case involving her complex relationship with the Stylers and her disappearance added intrigue to an already mysterious story. Investigators were focused on unraveling what happened when Nancy confronted the Stylers about alleged debts. The police's initial release of Trey and Nancy Styler after a 12-hour interview raised questions about their involvement in Nancy Feister's murder. Besides Kathy's report of a dispute, there was a lack of concrete evidence linking them to the crime. However, the discovery of crucial evidence shortly after their release would cast a new light on the case. The breakthrough came when a man collecting trash just 100 yards from the motel where the Stylers had been staying stumbled upon items belonging to Nancy Feister. Having heard about her murder in the news, he recognized the significance of the find and promptly alerted the police. Upon investigating, Law enforcement located the bag referred to by the informant, which contained some of Nancy Feister's personal belongings. Intriguingly, the Stylers Jaguar vehicle registration was discovered within the same bag, raising perplexing questions about why it would be in Nancy's possession. But the discoveries didn't stop there. The police unearthed an old hammer, which they believed to be the murder weapon. Upon testing, it was revealed that the hammer bore traces of Nancy Fister's blood. Even more damning, Trey Styler's DNA was found on the plastic bag containing the hammer. Additionally, a key to Nancy's closet was discovered only a few yards from the Styler's motel room. Armed with this newfound evidence, the police rearrested Trey and Nancy Styler, this time charging them with first-degree murder. It appeared that the pieces of the puzzle were finally falling into place pointing towards their involvement in Nancy Fister's brutal death. However, a cloud of uncertainty still loomed over the case. The police remained open to the possibility of other individuals being involved, or the Stylers potentially being framed. Some aspects of the evidence appeared too conveniently placed, raising suspicions of a hidden hand manipulating the situation. Additionally, Trey's fragile physical condition due to his neurological ailment posed questions about his capability to carry out such a heinous crime alone. As the investigation continued, the search for the full truth expanded to explore whether there were other players in this chilling murder mystery. The arrest of Kathy Carpenter, a friend of Nancy Feister and a local bank teller, sent shockwaves through the Aspen community. It was a twist in the investigation that nobody had anticipated. As the police delved deeper into their inquiry, 
they began to uncover a series of factors that raised suspicions about Kathy's involvement in the case. Despite her friendship with Nancy Pfister, there were underlying tensions stemming from Kathy's perception that Nancy treated her more as a personal assistant, even though she had never been compensated for that role. The police suspected that Kathy may have formed a connection with Nancy Styler, sharing stories about their common grievances regarding Nancy Feister. One particularly troubling discovery was that just one day after Kathy had found Nancy's lifeless body, she had visited Nancy's safety deposit box at Alpine Bank and removed $6,000 of Nancy's money, along with two family rings. When questioned about this, Kathy explained that Nancy had granted her legal access to the safe deposit box and claimed that she had taken these items with the intention of delivering them to Nancy's daughter, Juliana. Despite the complexities of their relationship, Kathy maintained that she cared deeply for Nancy and considered her a good friend. She acknowledged that Nancy could be demanding and often issued instructions, but she also emphasized the enjoyable moments they had shared together. Adding to the police's suspicions, records revealed that Nancy Styler had made three or four phone calls to Kathy on the 26th of February, just before Nancy Feister's lifeless body was discovered. This communication pattern fueled the investigators' belief that the three individuals might have been connected to Nancy Feister's murder in some way. The twists and turns in the case of Nancy Pfister's tragic death continued to unfold with a shocking revelation. Just weeks before the trial was set to begin, Trey, one of the key figures in the case, made an unexpected decision. He approached the judge and expressed his desire to confess to the crime. Trey's confession led to a plea deal that sent shockwaves through the courtroom. In exchange for pleading guilty to the lesser charge of second-degree murder, and accepting a 20-year prison sentence. Trey offered to divulge the horrifying details of what had truly happened to Nancy Pfister. However, a crucial and fateful component of this plea deal was that Nancy Styler, Trey's wife, would be granted unconditional freedom from any charges related to Nancy Pfister's death. Before the judge, Trey uttered the words that would seal his fate. I am guilty, Your Honor. He went on to describe a chilling account of the events that transpired that fateful night. According to Trey's confession, he had initially gone to Nancy Fister's house with the intention of reasoning with her. When he left his motel room, his wife was asleep, unaware of the impending tragedy. As he entered Nancy Fister's unlocked home, he discovered her peacefully asleep in her bedroom. The sight of Nancy sleeping peacefully became an unbearable weight on Trey's already troubled mind. His life was unraveling, plagued by financial ruin, and Nancy Fister's relentless demands for money, coupled with her retention of his spa equipment. And there was Nancy, seemingly untouched by the turmoil, sleeping soundly in her bed. It was a breaking point for Trey, causing him to lose his grip on rationality. In a shocking turn of events, Trey recounted how he went to the garage and retrieved a trash bag and a hammer. He returned to Nancy's bedroom, where he brutally bludgeoned her with the hammer, repeatedly striking her until she was lifeless. To minimize the evidence of the gruesome crime, he placed the bag over Nancy's head after her death and carefully moved her body onto a sheet on the floor. Tying her lifeless form with an extension cord, Trey dragged Nancy Fister's body into the closet, concealing it from the world. Trey's sentence of 20 years, as stipulated in his plea deal, marked the beginning of a dark chapter for him within the prison walls. Simultaneously, Nancy Styler, who had now adopted the name Nancy Masson Styler, made a dramatic escape from the shadows of her past. She changed her identity, relocated to another state, and filed for divorce from Trey. However, the story took yet another tragic turn. On August 6, 2015, Trey was discovered dead inside his prison cell, a grim conclusion that was ruled as a suicide. Following Trey's death, Nancy Styler, now Nancy Masson Styler, 
managed to collect a substantial sum of $1 million from a life insurance policy.